Like my cat, I often simply do what I want to do. I am then not using an ability that only persons have. We know that there are reasons for acting, and that some reasons are better or stronger than others. One of the main subjects of this book is a set of questions about what we have reason to do. I shall discuss several theories. Some of these are moral theories, others are theories about rationality. We are particular people. I have my life to live, you have yours. What do these facts involve? What makes me the same person throughout my life, and a different person from you? And what is the importance of these facts? What is the importance of the unity of each life, and of the distinction between different lives and different persons? These questions are the other main subject of this book. My two subjects, reasons and persons, have close connections. I believe that most of us have false beliefs about our own nature and our identity over time, and that, when we see the truth, we ought to change some of our beliefs about what we have reason to do. We ought to revise our moral theories and our beliefs about rationality. Many introductions to books of this kind try to explain the central concepts that are used. Since it would take at least a book to give a helpful explanation, I shall waste no time in doing less than this. My central concepts are few. We have reasons for acting. We ought to act in certain ways, and some ways of acting are morally wrong. Some outcomes are good or bad in a sense that has moral relevance. It is bad, for example, if people become paralyzed, and we ought, if we can, to prevent this. Most of us understand my last three sentences well enough to understand my arguments. I shall also use the concept of what is in someone's self-interest, or what would be best for this person. I discuss this briefly in Appendix I. My last central concept is that of a person. Most of us think we understand what persons are. I claim that we do not. Many introductions also try to explain how, when discussing morality, we can hope to make progress. Since the best explanation would be provided by making progress, this is the only explanation I shall try to give. Strawson describes two kinds of philosophy, descriptive and revisionary. Descriptive philosophy gives reasons for what we instinctively assume, and explains and justifies the unchanging central core in our beliefs about ourselves and the world we inhabit. I have great respect for descriptive philosophy, but by temperament, I am a revisionist. Except in my dreary chapter one, where I cannot avoid repeating what has been shown to be true, I try to challenge what we assume. Philosophers should not only interpret our beliefs. When they are false, they should change them. 1. Theories that are indirectly self-defeating. What do we have most reason to do? Several theories answer this question. Some of these are moral theories. Others are theories about rationality. When applied to some of our decisions, different theories give us different answers. We must then try to decide which is the best theory. 
Arguments about these theories are of many kinds. One argument is that a theory is self-defeating. This argument, uniquely, needs no assumptions. It claims that a theory fails even in its own terms, and thus condemns itself. The first part of this book discusses what this argument achieves. As I shall explain, all of the best-known theories are, in certain ways, self-defeating. What does this show? In some cases, nothing. In other cases, what is shown is that a theory must be developed further, or extended. And in other cases, what is shown is that a theory must either be revised or rejected. This is what is shown about the moral theories that most of us accept. I start with the best known case. 1. The self-interest theory. We can describe all theories by saying what they tell us to try to achieve. According to all moral theories, we ought to try to act morally. According to all theories about rationality, we ought to try to act rationally. Call these our formal aims. Different moral theories and different theories about rationality give us different substantive aims. By aim, I shall mean substantive aim. This use of aim is broad. It can describe moral theories that are concerned not with personal go moral goals, but with rights or duties. Suppose that, on some theory, five kinds of act are totally forbidden. This theory gives to each of us the aim that he never acts in these five ways. I shall first discuss the self-interest theory, or S. This is a theory about rationality. S gives to each person this aim. The outcomes that would be best for himself, and that would make his life go for him as well as possible. To apply S, we must ask what would best achieve this aim. Answers to this question I call theories about self-interest. As Appendix I explains, there are three plausible theories. On the hedonistic theory, what would be best for someone is what would give him most happiness. Different versions of this theory make different claims about what happiness involves and how it should be measured. On the desire fulfillment theory, what would be best for someone is what would best fulfill his desires throughout his life. Here, again, there are different versions of this theory. Thus, the success theory appeals only to a person's desires about his own life. On the objective list theory, certain things are good or bad for us, even if we would not want to have the good things or avoid the bad things. Here again, there are different versions. The good things might include knowledge, development of one's abilities, and the awareness of true beauty. The bad things might include sadistic pleasure, being deceived, and losing liberty or dignity. These three theories partly overlap. On all these theories, happiness and pleasure are at least part of what makes our lives go better for us, and pain and misery are at least part of what makes our lives go worse. These claims would be made by any plausible objective list theory, and they are implied by all versions of the desire fulfillment theory. On all theories, the hedonistic theory is at least part of the truth. To save words, this will sometimes be the only part that I discuss. All these theories also claim that, in deciding what would be best for someone, we should give equal weight to all the parts of this person's future. Later events may be less predictable. 
and a predictable event should count for less if it is less likely to happen. But it should not count for less merely because if it happens, it will happen later. It would take at least a book to decide between the different theories about self-interest. This book discusses some of the differences between these theories, but does not try to decide between them. Much of this book discusses the self-interest theory. As I have said, this is not one of the theories about self-interest. It is a theory about rationality. We can discuss S without deciding between the different theories about self-interest. We can make claims that would be true on all of these theories. It will help to call some aims ultimate. Other aims are instrumental, mere means to the achievement of some ultimate aim. Thus, for all except misers, being rich is not an ultimate aim. I can now restate the central claim of S. This is S1. For each person, there is one supremely rational ultimate aim, that his life go for him as well as possible. As we shall see, S makes several other claims. There are several objections to S. Some of these I discuss in parts 2 and 3. In what follows, I discuss the objection that, like certain other theories, S is self-defeating.